Hi, we're going to continue today with our study of existentialism, and particularly we're going to continue with the theme that de Beauvoir raised of what it means to be a woman in contemporary society. Uh, she says in the second sex, the conclusion of the second sex, uh, page 761, within the human collectivity, nothing is natural, and woman, among others, is a product developed by civilization. So in other words, she's saying uh, what it means to be a woman isn't just a natural thing that, you know, ha that happens to you biologically. Woman is a social meaning, a, a, a social interpretation that uh, people have of what women are. Uh, the word woman, in other words, defines a role that, uh, that people grow up into. Um, and she says that's a product developed by civilization. And so that's what we're going to be doing today. We're going to look at what that product is, what the, what the product woman is. Uh, and to do that, we're going to uh, look at uh, John Berger's book, Ways of Seeing, and we're going to focus on chapters 3 and 7. Uh, and Berger uh, begins by identifying uh, what he calls the social presence of men and women. And that's the thing I want us then to talk about first. Um, in just three pages of this book, uh, pages 45 to 47, he, he defines uh, this the, the different kind of social presence that men and women have. It's a very powerful set of pages, and that's what we're going to talk about. But before looking directly at the text, I want you just to look at a few images. Uh, these are all ads. Uh, this first one is a Dolce & Gabbana ad. Um, and I want you to look at this and the other ones that I'm going to look at and just see what you notice about the men and the women, uh, about how they're functioning, how they're behaving in these ads, how they appear, how they're interacting with each other, and so on. Uh, so I'm just going to show them to you first. We're going to talk about them a little bit later. So there's a Dolce & Gabbana one. Uh, here's another one. It's a Do Dos Equis ad, beer ad. Uh, this one is an ad for for e-cigarettes. Here's a man in this one. Take back your freedom. And then here's an interesting one. Same cigarette company. Uh, and here's a woman in that ad. So you could think about. Maybe I'll put those up together. You can think about how the image of the man in the blue cigarette ad and the image of the woman in the blue cigarette ad are similar or different. And then the last one I'll put up right now is, is just this 9 to 5 style, like women's clothing. So I just put those up there for you to look at quickly, uh, just to get them, get them in your mind. And we'll come back and we'll talk about them. Uh, but I want to begin then by reading uh, uh, what he says about social presence, the most basic thing. So he says, According to usage and conventions, which are at last being questioned, but have by no means been overcome, the social presence of a woman is different in kind from that of a man. A man's presence is dependent upon the promise of power which he embodies. A man's presence suggests what he is capable of doing to you or for you. Next paragraph. Um, by contrast, a woman's presence expresses her own attitude to herself and defines what can and cannot be done to her. There is nothing she can do which does not contribute to her presence. Basically what he means is these are the terms socially in which we're prepared to recognize men and women. Right? So this, the, in other words, the, this, these are, as he says, the conventions and social values uh, that we have grown up into that provide us with our terms for th for uh, thinking about what it means to be a man and a woman. And these, in other words, are the terms or the, the expectations that we bring to to others whom we meet. Right? And so and so the basic thing he's saying about men and women is that the 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 view we as a culture operate with about what a man is, is that a man is an agent. A man is someone who goes out and does things, has an effect in the world, does things 
to things, does things to you, does things to objects, whatever. Whereas a woman is not understood as an agent. A woman is understood as an object. Um, and, and it's specifically an object for men, for men's desires, for men's desiring gaze and so on. Um, so let's, let's just look quickly at a couple of those images again that I brought up before. Uh, let's look back to that blue ad. Uh, you know, here, you know, the cigarette is saying, like, you know, it's, it's going to really let you be a man, basically, right? You're going to be this powerful guy who uh, obviously can afford a really expensive either co condo or a hotel room, you know, looking out over the city where he's going to do stuff, right? Like, the man looks out over the world kind of like his kingdom, or at least, if not his kingdom, the domain he's going to go out into and, you know, try to succeed in, right? Um, but then the, the, the same ad, um, same cigarettes, for its portrayal of the woman, portrays the woman uh, waiting in bed for him to have sex with her, right? In her sexy lingerie, wearing uh, nighttime shoes and so on. Like, the, this ad is, again, just like he's going to look out at the world and see that stuff he's going to try to take control over. Like, this is another thing he's going to get, right? So the... This ad isn't selling power uh, women who are going to be powerful leaders of business, right? It's it's a it's speaking to who the woman is going to be for that man, who's going to be a powerful leader of business, right? Uh, but so you think, well, surely there are ads that also show women at work, right? So like here's here's a nine to five style, right? Here's here's how women should dress for work right they should look like cutesy little girls who are kind of um ditzy or whatever the word is for you know being kind of spacey and dumb right like they're they're all in these uh goofy little poses wearing basically sort of infantilizing clothes uh but looking very pretty for men right that's that's how women should look at work right that's so contrast that with uh how the you know the tough guy is portrayed um with blue so the, the point i want to get out of those then is just uh i just want to use those to, to quickly try to conjure up the sense that men are portrayed as agents and women are portrayed as objects right so that's that's the core point he's making about how we interpret man and woman and that, that's not um, just a sort of idea. That's not a sort of a theoretical thing. It's a practical thing. In other words, these are the terms that dictate how we interact with each other. And the thing then that he says about women's presence in relationship, in relationship to this is particularly important and, and particularly chilling. Right? He says, uh, I'll read it again. By contrast, a woman's presence expresses her own attitude to herself and defines what can and cannot be done to her. And it says, there is nothing she can do which does not contribute to her presence. Um, what that means uh, is that basically men decide how to treat women based on their perception of how women handle themselves. Uh, so uh, women are defined in the eyes of men specifically uh, in, uh, in terms of this issue of how they handle themselves. And that is further read as uh, how, they, how women are to be dealt with. Let me read you a later line. Uh, this is from page 47 now. He says that uh, every one of her actions... Uh, whatever its direct purpose or motivation is also read as an indication of how she would like to be treated. Right? So in other words, he's saying that part of the very meaning of woman in our society is that women are understood as sort of for men, as to be treated, to be handled by men. And that's, that's, the, um, that's the primary issue in relationship to which a woman's behavior is evaluated. 
As an aside, I'd mentioned that uh, another great existentialist writer, also very influenced by the work of Jean-Paul Sartre, uh, Frantz Fanon, uh, says very similar things, analogous things, about uh, experiences of race, uh, and particularly what it, what it is to be black in, in, uh, in the context of uh, European culture. And so if you're interested in issues of race and racism, uh, and you want to see how these similar ideas uh, might be employed in that context, you, I recommend you look at um, Frantz Fanon, especially his book, uh, Black Skin, White Masks, and especially the essay, uh, The Lived Experience of um, the Black Man. I have some lectures on YouTube about that if you want to see them. Anyway, um, uh, back to Berger. Um, so as I was saying, you know, that he's saying the very, the very thing about being a woman is that a woman is defined in terms of how she appears, and her appearance is defined as for men and as uh, a kind of um, code for how she is to be treated. So every, and everything that she does, whether she wants it to be this or not, is um, interpreted in that way. Right? And he has a particular line in there uh, on page 46. He says, to be born a woman has been to be born into the keeping of men. Right? So the, the, in other words, it's, it's a man's world. That's how that we live with, under that definition. And women are effectively defined in terms of their value for men. And so, so let's look at the next line after that. He says, the social presence of women has developed as a result of their ingenuity in living under such tutelage within such a limited space. Now, basically, what he means by that is um, uh, men decide how to treat women based on how they look to them. And so learning how to deal with that issue is essential to navigate the role of woman. And so to grow up to be a woman in contemporary society uh, necessarily means taking on that issue of being defined as an object for men and, and learning how to work, how to live in that context, how to work with that context. Um, and it's by, by learning to handle that in ways that are deemed satisfactory, uh, uh, that success becomes a possibility for women. Right? That, in other words, uh, f for women in contemporary society, success isn't primarily a sort of neutral uh, uh, response to merit. Being able to succeed in contemporary society for women depends on succeeding in this game, for lack of a better word, uh, although it's a pretty serious game, uh, of um, successfully inhabiting that role of um, someone who is an object for men. Uh, so the next thing he says is, um, a woman must continually watch herself. She's almost constantly accompanied by her own image of herself. While she is walking across a room or while she is weeping at the death of her father, she can scarcely avoid envisaging herself walking or weeping. From earliest childhood, she has been taught and persuaded to survey herself continually. Um, so here, here's a couple of images. Uh, the, the point is uh, that, first, that women are always on display. So this is a, an old ad, of, uh, according to the internet, I didn't check it up beyond that, but according to the internet, this is an ad from uh, 1939 from the Kellogg's company. And, uh, you know, the guy says, uh, the harder a wife works, the cuter she looks. The, the point I wanted to bring out there is, of course, first that caption, that how the woman looks is, you know, what matters. But also just look at the way she's dressed, right? Here's a woman who's uh, supposed to be at home doing the cleaning. And, you know, check out her shoes. Um, I don't typically do my house cleaning in basically uncomfortable evening wear. Right? Um, so... I show you that ad, you know, uh, you wouldn't quite see that ad now, 
you know, that, pe people would look at that ad and laugh and say, ah, ha, ha, look how they used to make ad in, ads in the 1930s. Um, but, but I think, you know, if you go back to some of those ads I showed you at the beginning, you might not see um, relationships that are so different, right? In this Dolce & Gabbana ad, uh, you know, look at the clothes that these women are wearing. Um, and contrast that, for example, with the man, uh, father, grandfather, whatever he is, grandfather, I guess, sitting on the chair. Uh, and just, just think about the difference in the values expressed in the way those people are dressed. Um, and notice, obviously, that all the men in that picture are looking at the women. Uh, and the women are obviously performing for the men, right? So, of course, they're not... Uh, doing the laundry or doing the dusting here. That's, that's, that's plain enough. But I, but I want you to see that uh, what the rules are of these people, right? It, very clearly, these women are objects for the men's gaze. Right? Um, and let me show you another one. So remember he says, uh, you know, um, uh, while she's walking across a room, she can't avoid envisaging herself. Because in other words, people are con concerned about how she appears. Well, that was sort of my point with um, you know, while you're while you're doing the dishes, how you look is what's being evaluated. And the other one he says is uh, while she's weeping at the death of her father. Right. So here's an image I just grabbed again off the internet uh, about how to dress at a funeral. Um, and of course, at some level, uh, I imagine everybody has some concern at, at any social event about how they dress. It makes sense. Uh, but but the but my point here and and his point again is that for women at a funeral, the, the reality is they're at a fashion show at some level, right? In other words, they, they are still going to be evaluated for how they measure up to the standards of desirable object in a way that men are not. Men, men are going to be concerned about wearing appropriate clothes at the funeral too, but their clothes are going to say something different. Uh, they're not going to be, you know, uh, versions of sexy evening wear or something like that right um so anyways uh so so the, with those images i want just to pick out his line about you know whenever she's walking across the floor or, or weeping uh, uh, mourning her father she's still on display and i just want to bring those kind of ideas back to you through those ads uh but the point he makes then is that well you know if if growing up uh to succeed in the role of being a woman means learning how to inhabit that role effectively. It means that just as men are always looking at women and evaluating them, their appearance, uh, women also then have to learn always to be cognizant of their own appearance. Right? You, women have to take on that interpretation of themselves if they're going to succeed at that game as i called it right but so that means that women themselves have to adopt a view on themselves that is effectively the view men adopt on them or at least what women take to be that view right so there is in other words he's saying a thing that we can basically call the you know the male gaze the desiring look that the powerful man directs at the attractive woman object. Uh, and that, that I say male gaze because that is pointedly the view for the man and it's a view about the woman. And he's saying women essentially have to internalize that male gaze and evaluate themselves on the basis of that. So they have to essentially live out of an internalized way of interpreting themselves as men interpret them. You might remember there um, Freud's analysis of the superego, right? And the idea that, you know, you sort of develop a conscience and so on, a self-critical attitude by uh, internalizing the voice of the father, right? Well, so Berger is saying basically the same thing, but saying, you know, distinctively of women that what they have to internalize is the perspective of men, right? And so that the perspective of men acts like a kind of quasi-moral superego in the experience of women, right? That's the standard that they have to measure up to, 
right? And to to succeed in he's, Berger is saying that to succeed in this society, in the role of woman, requires of you, requires of the woman, that she adopt basically the male gaze as her internalized superego, as her moral conscience. Um, so let me go back and uh, read again what he says here. This is near the bottom of 46. He says, men survey women before treating them. Well, that was the point I was making before. And he says, consequently, how a woman appears to a man can determine how she will be treated. Right? That's what we were talking about. And, and as he said, there's nothing a woman can do that doesn't contribute to that. Right? And so, the, the next line, to acquire some control over this process, women must contain it and interiorize it. Uh, and I, I want to add just one more point, right? And that was that line from before where he says, from earliest childhood, she has been taught and persuaded to survey herself continually, right? Well, it's that earliest childhood part. Uh, you know, remember again, we, we've seen this a lot, Aristotle talking about how our upbringing is the thing that matters. Freud talking about our early developmental experiences in the way... Uh, our parents deal with these issues of dependency and so on, sex roles later on. Uh, and then uh, last time, Lang talking about that issue of ontological security, right? Taking these that same sort of theme at a pretty deep level and saying, you know, what's really going on with a child is trying to win confirmation, you know, that she is something. And so the thing Berger is saying here is what's what's happening with the girl is that she's learning that she has to live out this role to be confirmed in the eyes of others as real, as proper, as, as being what she's supposed to be, right? It's by doing this that she gets that sense that she's okay. Right? So... Um, so that's then the thing, the, the core idea then that I want you to think about here, bringing this together with the other things we've been studying. Right? I want you to think about how these issues of sex roles are built into the very formative processes by which we become a somebody. Right? So, you know, Freud was already talking about that when he was talking about the phallic stage. Berger is really showing you something about how that works, right? He's showing you what the social pressures are on men and women to develop certain particular kinds of um, gender identities, right? And he's cashing out a little bit what those relationships are. So that's, that's what these pages 45 to 47 are about. So I want to turn now to the next section where he talks about a distinction He's going to make between the naked and the nude, which is directly relevant to these different kinds of social roles we've been talking about. And then, as we're going to see next time, it's going to be directly relevant to our attempt to philosophically understand our sexuality. So what he's doing is looking at the tradition of European painting and that particular kind of painting that is the nude. And, and basically his point is that uh, the nude is the woman seen as object for the male gaze. Right? That, that's, that's basically what's being brought out here. Um, and I only want to uh, uh, show you one image about that point and then uh, bring out two uh, sort of conclusions about that. Um, so I'm going to look at this image that he looks at on page uh, 52, uh, which is, uh, in fact, you know, it's a, it's a mythological picture, you know, Venus and Cupid, but it's in fact... He says a, a picture of uh, the king's mistress, Nell Gwyn. Um, and, and the point is here, he says, what's, what's really happening here is this is a portrait of that woman, young woman, showing herself as an object for the king. And, Ber and Berger says the point of this painting is that the king can put it on the wall and everybody else, come, all the other men come into the room and look at it, and they're envious because they think, oh, I wish I had her as my sexual object. Right? So this is really uh, his, the king's um, sort of certificate of ownership. And his having, you know, this beautiful young woman uh, 
who gives herself to him is something that elevates his status or establishes his status in in the eyes of these other men and so on right so 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 there there are two points there one this is a portrayal of the woman displaying herself as an object second uh, it functions as a kind of currency her her existence as an object and the image of it and his possession of it functions as a kind of currency in the sort of social relationships of men right? so the two things that i want to say then are, are first uh the, that point about her adopting the stance of object right like so so the the, the basic point that uh, Berger wants to make about the, the, the na naked and the nude is that the nude is a kind of stylized posture. The nude is a, a kind of convention developed, you know, over some centuries, I guess, in the history of painting for how to display a woman as an object for the man's gaze. And uh, you can learn how to do that if you're a woman or if you're a man for that matter. But specifically if you're a woman you can learn how to adopt that posture basically how to pose as a desirable object right and so so Berger's first point is that's what it means to be nude to be nude is to pose yourself as a desirable object so 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 the nude is a woman without clothes on he says but she's not naked the nude is the woman without clothes on, but she's wearing a kind of posture. She hasn't really got naked in the sense of revealing herself. She has put on a kind of conventional costume. So we'll talk about that more next time. But I wanted you just to get that idea first, right? That uh, the, the idea that even though this woman doesn't have clothes on, it's not really true in, in the sense he's talking about to call her naked because he's saying nakedness is something like shedding disguises, shedding clothes, shedding protective covering and showing yourself as you really are. Whereas what's happening in this kind of posturing is precisely posturing. It's putting on a kind of show with your unclothed body. So that's basically the distinction he wants to make between the naked and the nude. And, and so the only point about that that I want to bring out this week is the idea that that whole story we've been developing about the role of women as objects is also then the expectation that women will be nudes, right? Uh, and then the last po point I want to make is, is just that one about this actually functioning not so much... Uh, in terms of uh, an intimate interaction between the king and his mistress, but uh, as a kind of currency in his political and social dealings with these other men. Um, uh, here's another picture that uh, uh, Berger shows towards the end. This is by uh, Bouguereau. Uh, you know, and he says, you know, here's a painting, you know, again, a kind of a mythological scene. And you might just think, oh, that's a nice picture. It happens to have a lot of naked women in it and so on. But his point is, no, it doesn't just happen to have a bunch of naked women in it. This is a picture that has a specific purpose. You, again, you put it up in the, in the office, in the wall of the, you know, palace or whatever. And it's there so that all the businessmen or courtiers or noblemen or whoever they are who are there, you know, like in the president's office, in the White House or whatever, all those people who are there can see it. And just like the portrait of his mistress was about showing his sort of power and superiority over the other nobles, he's saying this, this is a picture that says to every man who's in the room, you know, every, every political or political figure or businessman or whatever, oh yeah, you're, you are men, you know, you, you own all the women, right? This is showing that like women are yours, right? So this place uh, is again a kind of currency in the relation of men but of a different a different sort this one doesn't so much say the king's got something you have to be envious of this says you're a man and you you've got that great power over all these other all the over all these other people um so i want you to look at these two 
pictures uh, in the context of his uh, discussion of European art to to see this issue of like how the nude functions and and it's basically making two points right that the the notion of being nude is the notion of defining yourself or portraying yourself as an object for the male gaze right and so he's he's saying that that's part of that whole story of how women are defined in society in relationship to men and then the second point i want to make is, and that i want you to be thinking about here is how that also becomes a um, that also makes women a kind of player or not so much a player as a, as a kind of, um, well, I used the word before, a kind of currency in the relationships between men. And indeed, um, in chapter seven, uh, you know, he says, you know, what, what's advertising really about? We're going to talk about advertising a little bit more, I think, probably next time. But what's advertising really about? Well, it's about selling something. Uh, and it sells something by giving you an image of somebody you'd like to be, right? And he says it sells glamour. And with that, I just want to go back finally to this last image about the, you know, this guy they call the most interesting man in the world at ha here at Happy Hour, the Dos Equis guy. Right? Uh, um, the, this ad, you know, has a certain kind of jokey quality about it when it says the most interesting man in the world, but it's only sort of a joke. Because in a way, that's what ads do. They portray successful men. You know, like that blue ad. The idea was uh, that was a picture of a powerful guy, you know. Uh, so here again, this this is a, a man, and, and what's he got beside him? He's got these beautiful women who just don't have nothing else on their mind except being there for him, right? And so that's that's kind of an image to a man of what you can be, and and success turns out to be having these little appendages around you, these these women. So I want you just to put that ad in the context of that portrait of Nell Gwynn and the Bouguereau picture of all the naked women um, and to think then about uh, not just the issue of for women of the reality of having to embrace the role of being an object but also what role um, yeah what role women adopting that role plays in men's aspirations, uh, men's self-interpretation, and so on. Uh, so I'll leave it there for now, uh, but next time we'll come back, we'll look more at the issue of the naked and the nude, and especially bring that back more directly to uh, reflection on sexuality, on our, on our own sexuality.